as well as raising awareness and changing mindsets. We were not happy selling our organic food in styrofoam containers and plastic. So we decided to begin importing and using compostable food containers. We have reduced the waste that we produce and we hope that this serves as an example to other business, large and small. In the supermarket business, we have historically created large amounts of plastic waste. We are now encouraging our customers to refuse plastic packaging throughout. More and more people are stepping up and bringing reusable bags. We only need to make a firm decision to start taking action. And when we all do our bit, collectively, we create huge changes. As we are learning to appreciate and enjoy our outdoor playground, we feel sad to see all the plastic bottles and styrofoam in our seas. Now that we have realized that plastics are a threat to our environment, we are becoming more conscious of our decisions. We live in an incredible place. Our islands are worth protecting. By changing our mindset and leading by example, we become more comfortable in spreading awareness to our friends, family and community of the many reasons why it is important to take good care of our environment. It's up to me. It's up to me. It's up to me. It's up to all of us. It is up to all of us to make these changes. And when more people join our efforts, we ensure a more sustainable future. One, one UN estimate um, put it that each year about 13 million tons of plastic is, is dumped into the oceans. And it is estimated that by the year 2050, we'll have more plastic than fish in our oceans. And so <clears throat> that kind of statistic is not sustainable at all for our environment. And so we have to do something. And that is why on World Environment Day, it is a people's day where we have to do something about protecting and conserving our local environment. CFBC are observing World Environment Day that's coming on uh, this year, that's coming on the 5th of June under the UN theme of beating plastic pollution. On pollution of the environment we cover broadly three areas or three types of pollution. One is um, land-based, air-based and water-based pollution. In all of those areas plastic pollution is a problem where plastic pollution can overwhelm our, land, uh, our landfill and other areas where they accumulate as point sources. We also have um, where much of the plastic, once we have heavy rainfall, will make their way into the sea. And when the plastic is burnt, we get air pollution coming from plastic. Give us an environmental studies assessment of what you see here. Um. Okay, over here you see some plastic waste that has washed up from the ocean. Um, this can be hazardous as if it's located on the beach, it shows that there's a lot more in the ocean because, as I said, it is washed up. Mangrove swamp is home to like, many types of animals and they come back to their habitat and they see all these plastic, all these foreign objects. 
that they've never seen before. They might eat it, that could potentially choke them, killing them off, and that lowers like the species diversity, you know, the amount of animals that actually live in the mangrove area. We're on Keys Beach, and if you just step onto Keys Beach, so you walk, you hit grass, as soon as you hit the sand line, you're going to see tons of bits of plastic. And so it ends up into the waterways, and we know, of course, that the sea brings it back on land. And then you have to think about the organisms eating it. And then it's stored in their fatty tissues, and it bioaccumulates. And then over a period of time, then you could have biomagnification as it moves up the food chain. It could be eating other organisms that these um, chemicals have been stored in their fatty tissues, and then we could get sick. So you have different illnesses that could come about from it, especially different cancers. Plastic is highly toxic for the human body, and so then we have to deal with that as an issue. We're here at Greenleaf Hydroponics Farm, and we're talking about plastic and plastic pollution in the environment and how dangerous it is to our ecosystem and our plants and nutrient cycling. It's things like centipedes and your insects in general, they are the ones that actually break down the once living matter we turn it to the ecosystem in a, in a nutrient cycling format, which we call the detritus cycle. So they're very, very important. Plastics impact them directly. And when we have situations where we have organic matter trapped or we have voids in soils created from large amount of plastic deposits, then we have that disconnect between the detritivores and the organic matter. So they slow the rate of return, if the plants can't go effectively, animals can't eat effectively, and if they can't eat effectively, it affects us as well as the animals. On this table, we are showcasing biodegradable, reusable alternatives to conventional plastics. Alternatives to plastic use include cloth bags and I'm sure that we can recall those bags that we use when I was growing up. We took those bags to the shops to purchase our bread and our groceries. We have um, bags made from jute or burlap and you can also use um, bamboo containers. We can switch to glass bottles, ceramic containers, we can reuse Single, instead of having our know, plastic bottles and just throwing them away after each single use, we can also have um, multiple use of our plastic bottles. We can also educate the, the general populace about the use of um, cosmetics. These cosmetics, many of them contain microbeads, uh, particularly facial scrubs, um, lotions, toothpaste. So we have to start thinking about things like sorting garbage. So you have your compost, which would be your chicken bones and your rice and the leftover bread and all that, separate apart from your aluminum cans, from your glass. Good day and welcome to Working For You. I am Leswell Williams. I thank you very much for joining us for today's program. Your company is well appreciated. Today I have officials from the Ministry of International Trade, Industry, Commerce and Consumer Affairs. They are my special guests on today's program. And we will be having a lively discussion about those subject matters. I would like to in introduce first to my immediate right, Mr. Stuart Laplace, who is the director 
of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bureau of Standards. Mr. Laplace, welcome. I also have with me the Director of Trade, Mr. Sean Lawrence. Mr. Lawrence, welcome. And the Director of Consumer Affairs, Mr. Paul Queeley. Mr. Queeley, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. We have also just been joined by Mr. Philip Brown, who is the Director of the Department of Industry, Commerce, and small business development. Welcome, Mr. Brown. The COVID-19 pandemic presents the world with an unprecedented public health challenge. Measures to curb the spread of the disease have shut down large swaths of the world economy. Worldwide demand for medical products to fight the pandemic is unprecedented. All countries depend on international trade and global value chains to source these products. This is challenging in light of ongoing disruptions to international transport, particularly air cargo, which often goes together with passenger travel. So gentlemen, while we are here to discuss what is happening in the Ministry of International Trade, Industry, Commerce and Consumer Affairs, we are well aware at this present time, the global climate, that of the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has affected international trade industry, commerce, and consumer affairs, consumer behavior, and all of that. But before we touch on, on those things, I would like you to give me a general overview in terms of what your department does, starting with Mr. Laplace. Thank you, Lassoi. With respect to the Bureau of Standards, what we do is to facilitate um, trade, so we ensure that the goods that are coming in and the goods that are going out are following the, the relevant standards, whether they are food standards or the international standards. And that way, we minimize a lot of um, risk and bottlenecks in terms of moving the, the, um, the cargo from point A to point B. From time to time, you might have um, international producers would reach out to us concerning any um, issues with any labeling requirements that think it's a Nevis may require before the items are, are brought here. So there's a lot of behind the scenes work that we do on the Bureau side to ensure that the, the trade is being facilitated in a timely manner. Mr. Lawrence, the Director of Trade, I, I know that all of these um, are connected. They, they, they are linked. International trade and industry and commerce and consumer affairs. It's one ministry because really and truly they are all interconnected. Correct. Mr. Yes, Lawrence. Um, before I go into the integrity of what we do in, in uh, the Ministry of Trade, I'll first start off by um, reading our mission and perhaps our vision. It will set the context for how um, we go forward. Um, in my discussion. The mission of international trade is to strengthen cooperation with a, with a global community, promote the country's contribution to multilateral trade organizations, and provide opportunities for economic investments by developing a range of programs aimed at promoting fair and accessible trade. Our vision is to strengthen policy making and, implement and implementation in accordance with the, with the strategic, political, social, and economic interests of Sikhs and Nevis. Within the context, what we can gather is that in international trade, our job is to facilitate the movement of goods and services. And in doing so, we must do so with, um, within the, the global context. Because at the end of the day, the movement of goods and services in all the country must be within um, must be within um, international trade agreements. 
So therefore, there are certain rules and regulations that must be followed. And in our department, what we do is basically facilitate trade within these specific guidelines at the same time balancing our national policies and goals. <laughs> that is basically the, the, what we do in our, in our department. Right. Mr. Queeley, the man responsible for consumer affairs. <clears throat> um, the consumer affairs department was established to inform, educate, and empower consumers to protect themselves when conducting transactions in the marketplace. We are the only agency with responsibility for consumer advocacy within the Federation, and in light of this, we were given the mandate of ensuring that the rights of consumers are defended and that a competent and fair marketplace is maintained. Some of our responsibilities um, include engaging in market research, um, we conduct surveys to get public perception on certain consumer issues that might be on the forefront at the time, a given time. Um, one at this moment that we are working on with SBDC is um, a consumer survey, business survey, to find out how COVID-19 has impacted small businesses. Mm -hmm. We provide complaint resolution services, um, normally by telephone or walk-ins, but preferably at this moment in time, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are more leaning towards email complaints. We ensure that businesses comply with the laws of the Consumer Protection Act of 2003. Um, we offer education services to the public through radio programs, such as our Consumer Corner radio program. And we also go into the schools, and we have, in, uh, we have created a consumer primary school quiz competition that is conducted annually which in the month of March. Um, I think I'll stay here for the moment, and I'll let Mr. Brown continue. Thank you, Mr. Queen. Mr. Brown, the Director of the Department of Industry, Commerce, and Small Business Development. Mr. Brown, it's an overview of, of your department. Thank you, Esbury. And um, as you quite rightly would have put it, um, the, the Department of Industry and Commerce is, is focused on business, business development. And so, you know, aptly and strategically placed in the Ministry of International Trade because all of the various departments are interconnected. We are responsible, in a way, for that virtual hand-holding type activity for our business community. As such, you know, we are facilitating and stimulating in all of those terms. Business. We do have, um, within the sector, some of the larger businesses and manufacturers that, that we would see them as um, in, in the enclave sector. But we also have the smaller manufacturers. And um, in order to facilitate this, while there is a, is, a, is a focus on things like exports and so on, we, we realize that there is a great need for some additional focus on small business. Hence, the, um, the establishment of what was NED, National Entrepreneurial Development Division, up until November 2018, when we would have evolved into what is now the Small Business Development Center. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's an organization that is, is more in tune to perhaps serving businesses um, in, in, in this current age with services such like business plan development, training, general management and, and guidance, advice, etc. Assistance with, with accessing incentives. And um, over the past five years or so, we would have seen hundreds of contractors, small enterprises, um, coming through our doors 
and in fact finding assistance via you know, our collaboration with, with um, our regional and international partners. Because it is important for us to note that we don't swear to have all of the answers. But one of the things, one of the services that we do provide is that networking, connecting type service where we would um, engage our regional colleagues and partners, the CDBs, the Caribbean exports, etc., to ensure that we provide the best possible service and direction, assistance for our business community, our entrepreneurs and our manufacturers, etc. Yeah, Mr. Brown, thank you. I, I want to start the next question or throw this question to Mr. Laplace. Mr. Laplace, your department deals with standards, quality assurance. Now, your department is a very important one because we can't have trade, we can't have industry, we can't have com commerce and consumer affairs without talking about standards. Standards are important um, when you are dealing with, with these areas. Now, I know that the Bureau of Standards has five departments. Could you tell us what these five departments are? And a little bit in terms of what they do. In terms of ensuring standards and quality assurance. Okay. Thank you. Um, at the Bureau, we have the multipurpose laboratory a part of our construct. So we have a chemistry department, we have a metrology department, we have a microbiology department, we have a standards department, and we now have a air quality department, which is the newest um, addition to our construct. Now in metrology, that is the, the science of weights and measure, and that department deals with calibrating all equipment that are used in trade. So if you go to the supermarkets or you go to the gas stations, you would notice that there would be some stickers being displayed there to verify that we have been to that location, we have checked those um, devices to ensure that what they are measuring is indeed correct and the, 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 um, the customer is not being robbed and you as a business owner is not um, giving away um, your product either. So it covers both the retailer as well as the, the customer because to us, they all are customers, right, involved in trade. Now, we are planning to expand some services in metrology along the lines of um, calibrating medical equipment along the lines of things like um, stethoscope and spectrometers, things used for blood pressure and, you know, heart at um, palpitation readings, etc. We want to get into electrical meter calibration. We also want to get into the gaming industry where we want to ca calibrate some of those um, machines that would you play the, the slots, what we call the slot machines. We want to get into um, testing of aggregates in terms of what is used on the roads and in construction generally testing um, cement, steel, blocks, ensure that they are of the right um, quality and standard to avoid any, any catastrophes. So these are some of the, the, um, the things that we have in, in our work plan moving forward. And currently we are expanding the metrology lab with funding from the EU and the Caribbean Development Bank to have an, an accredited lab here in Zengis and Nevis for metrology, where we can calibrate our standard weights that we are using to, to verify others, right? Traditionally, this is an exercise that would have incurred a um, significant um, amount of money that we would have to send our weights off to another lab, let's say in Jamaica. 
and that would run us anywhere between 40 to 50,000 US dollars a year. So I, I'm thinking it's, it's best that if we're able to do that ourselves here in St. Kitts, we can then offer that service to the neighboring um, islands as well that are closer to us geographically. Now moving on to chemistry. Chemistry is the, the largest department we have. We do a lot of work in, um, in chemistry. All of those alcohol verifications that were used during this COVID-19 pandemic, they were all um, tested by us. Those that um, came, of course, to, to the Bureau, we would have tested those along with the thermometers as well. Um, with chemistry though, we are planning to take it a lot further during um, the next two years where we are going for ISO 17025 accreditation. That is the top standard um, laboratory accreditation that all labs worldwide is measured against as a benchmark. So we are looking to, to go that route with respect to chemistry. And where trade is concerned, we are also trying to update some equipment where we can verify those jams and jellies and the, the coconut drops and the juices and the iced teas and all of these that our locals make and try to assist them in getting into the international market. We are aware of what the standard requirements are for some of these countries. So we are here to assist the, those persons in getting their labels, their calorific values, their, their sugars and proteins and calories added to their labels um, correctly to ensure that when it gets to the, the, the borders that we have no issues in terms of trade delays, right? So we're trying to facilitate trade in that, in that aspect. And because we're tied directly to international trade for the Bureau, we, our lab now is going to take on the role of a trade lab as well where we would be the ones to verify some of these items or uh, disputes associated with trade of goods coming out of St. Kitts and coming into St. Kitts as well. So we're going to get some, some equipment. We're getting a, a gas chromatographer as well as part of the funding um, construct from the CDB the EU under the 11 EDF. That's the European Development Fund, and that piece of equipment is what is going to be used to basically do all what I just mentioned. So we're going to test all the protein contents and stuff of, of the food using that equipment. We can also use it to test the quality of diesel and gas um, at the station. And of course, again, we're verifying that you, the customer, is getting the right quality of petrol that you're paying for and ensuring that the person who is buying it as the company is being sold the right um, quality grade in bulk as well. So it's, it's more of a verification um, additive that we have. We have the quality, and I think that is probably one of the most famous departments we have. A lot of persons would have seen us um, doing a lot of work in the, both in the government sector and the private sector. We do all the gases. Well, most of the gases, except the CFCs, we also do particulate matter, we do, we do mold, right, as well. And of course, that department, as I said, it's, it's being developed to, f to further enhance some of the additional requests that we would have had that we don't currently have the capabilities to do things like um, asbestos testing, as well as um, the noxious CFC gases that would come off the the landfill that would further inform um, institutions like physical planning whether this location that is slated for development would be um, ideal based on the, the type of um, partic particulate matter and fumes that we would pick up in, in that particular um, location from wind drift etc. And we also plan to put some of these devices in the in the downtown area, the, the the, um, the, the built-up area as well to see what type of particles that um, the, the patrons would be exposed to. And of course, last but not least, we have standards where that department, well, I, well not last, but I have microbe as well, but standards, 
deals with um, with ensuring that everything that we do in civil society is controlled by a standard and that way it improves the quality of life it improves the the um, the, the risk um, mitigation to ensure that we don't have anybody doing anything out of um, context or character to put anybody at harm whether in the physical aspect or, or something that you may um, induce from from eating something that is not um, being dealt with properly using um, a standard. We have seven standards that we have adopted for the first time. So we have seven standards called Lean Sinkits. And these standards are the, the package water standard. We have the specification for package water. We have the labeling of prepackaged food. We have the tourism standard, which is the beach standard. And I think that is one of the the, um, the areas that we are doing um, a trial run with the tourism. Um, we have the environmental management standard and that is for persons who want to consider doing any buildings or want any ideas of how to to make sure you, you go green and you do not impact the environment too much by the dumping and, and the, the use of plastics and that type of stuff. So we have a standard that can guide that process. We also have the Caribbean um, rubric standard, which deals with the conservation energy code, which ensures that anytime you purchase things like refrigerators and air condition, they have um, that stamp of approval in terms of um, the environmental impact you would have and the the amount of energy that is putting out versus um, how much you're, you're putting in and what is measured against um, with your, your bill, etc. And of course, we have the general requirements for goods and we have the specific requirement for goods. The general requirements, we are trying to make that as a technical regulation. We are, we're going to put um, a regulation in place to ensure that the goods coming into sink, it's must have a country of origin on it and it also must be in a language a native language that we can read and that is of course if there's any recalls or if there is any allergens contained on the packaging that you may be allergic to you must be able to read that and make an informed decision on whether you need to buy it or not and of course um, microbiology that department is with testing. We do a lot of work with the Ministry of um, Health, Water Department, etc. in both Sinkis and Nevis. And we, we do a lot of supportive work for um, restaurants and the, the water sources and the bottled waters, etc. So we work a lot um, behind the scenes to ensure that what's being put out there is it's safe to, to eat and, and, and consume in, in general. So. All in all, that is what we do across all those departments and as, a, as that arm of the Bureau of Standards, which is the multipurpose lab. The department really holds everything together. And in speaking, we are seeing all the different linkages, talking about the safety of food and all of that that has to do with really consumer affairs and, and, and all of that. Now, Mr. Lawrence, trade has been impacted of course we know because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the concern has been in terms of critical shortages at the national level now we have seen that in terms of you know consumer behavior you have people you know panic buying because somehow they feel as though they know that trade is being affected. The ships are not going to come. Are we going to have enough food? Are we going to have enough goods? And so on. And people start to panic. Now, in St. Kitts and Nevis, has there been any sort of export prohibitions and restrictions? And, and how really have we weathered the storm in terms of trade? during this COVID-19 pandemic? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. As you can see, we have, 
because we have, we have done a good time in, the, in terms of um, chattering the, the waters through this um, pandemic. Uh, but I want to touch on something, though, because um, the government of policy has never been to stop cargo. So panic shopping or panic buying was, 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 was basically um, based on, fa on false fears. Um, so ships were coming in and um, the, the shelves, uh, supermarket shelves, have been um, always been stuck with food. So that has never been a, a, an issue in terms of trade. But what we have done though, um, within the region from an old system standpoint of view, what we have done to facilitate trade and certain uh, what we call essential goods, we have done what we can at, 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 at the policy level to move certain essential goods, hand sanitizer, etc., to move those goods um, with seamless, seamlessly. So without any policy restriction, etc., to get those goods within, um, move between borders. So that, um, that was done. We also had meetings at the OASIS level and CARICOM level. We also had meetings with uh, at COSEM as well too, to go through what, what, we, what we consider to be um, essential goods. So we had that meeting. What we did also was to make sure that these particular items move without any restrictions in terms of um, tariff, um, et cetera. So we have done that and continue um, um, to do so. So on the trade side, we have done a good job, so to speak. But to go further, well, you, you, you touched on something um, when you spoke about um, standards being everything. Um, trade is done via standards, of course. Um, even within the, the pandemic situation, um, standards had to be put in place for trade to continue. And as you see, as certain as economies were closed, so to speak, you can see the effects are the importance of, 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 of facilitating trade. And therefore, it brought about a fear in terms of um, goods, services, and of course, people. Um, we don't trade just because we can trade. There's always a, 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 a means to an end. Um, trade at the end of the day must, must have a an impact on the socio-economic life of, 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 of that specific country. So at the end, end of the day, we trade because we want to basically expand our markets. We want to be able to sell our goods and also to buy our goods. One of the things, um, for example, when you walk into a supermarket, you see things on the shelves from coffee, um, chicken, even this equipment that they're looking at. Those are results of, of um, trade facilities facilitating trade. One of the things I want to touch on as well too, apart, what we're doing also trade is, is also to enhance um, training, capacity building in all areas. For example, we will contact um, certain organizations to be in training for, um, for alcohol processors. Um, from, the, from, from the custom side, and the thing you can bring in um, Exports on the WTO, do with virtual organization to build um, capacity in t um, to build. So we, 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 so when we trade, we know what we're doing and why we're doing what we are doing. We, we, we for example, um, you have training in, um, in services. For example, um, there's the economic partnership agreement. So how do you take advantage of, of that specific agreement? So we have experts coming to actually to build our knowledge. And um, for, if you're going to trade your services, you must, know, you, must, you must know what is required. You must, you must know what um, standard is required to trade your services. You must know what, your, what, 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 what rates you have as well too. For example, if you move your goods, you must know, um, uh, or you want to, um, to basically to sell your services, you must know what the, barriers, what the barriers are and how you can overcome these specific barriers. So those are the things that, that we do in, in trade. Um, from the standard point, um, point of view, what we are looking at as well to, let me say this, one of the things that came out of the, the are coming out of, the, of this um, COVID situation, the, you, you're gonna hear terms like resi resilience, um, food security. Those are words that we take seriously in trade. 
we take seriously in trade. Um, food security is an issue. So uh, trade covers everything. Good services, don't get big or small, from the small man to the largest man. So we must know what this issue are and what is and the how it, how it impacts um, every sector, from the tourism sector to to touring to taxi man to, to the person selling mangoes and the industry. Right. So we must know how how how, how everyone is, is, is affected in, in terms of in terms of trade. So what we do basically is basically is to look at these specific issues and how we, we can mitigate the, any, any situation that, that, that will affect them to sell their product or to make a living. So at the end of the day, what we do is to make sure that any action taken, it brings about the, 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 the government policy in terms of poverty alleviation, um, create employment, and things, and things of that nature. So that's basically from my end. But right, so we, we can talk about trade on the international level, and we can talk about trade in terms even on the, the local level. And trade has been affected because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it has been affected because trade depends on the transport sector. Exactly. And the transport sector, transport and manufacturing sector, those are two sectors that have been affected because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And because they have been affected, trade has been affected as well. For example, the people who trade their business in the tourism industry, they have not been able to do so because, of course, people are not coming. That is, a, um, that is one of the major impacts that they were sinks and nervous were globally. Once people can't move, then you're going you're, you're, you're gonna to feel, feel the impact of it. For example, those of us who are, who are tourism dependent are going to feel it a, a lot more. In fact, um, I don't want to say tourism dependent because even moving agricultural products, because the key thing is transportation. Because what did, the effects of the pandemic was um, um, transportation, so to speak. And if you have a lockdown, uh, a core fuel, then the the revenue expected will not be there. Uh, if revenues are coming in, um, it doesn't mean your 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 expense fall. So you gonna have um, layoff. Businesses are gonna close down. So what you've seen the government um, attempting to do in the efforts is to continue to facilitate trade. So they're looking at um, opening the borders again. So not just to, like I say, you know, is is to is to stimulate basically the economy, and that's what trade um, trade does. So those are the measures um, that, that 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 are being looked at. And then you spoke about the manufacturing sector as well too. See, because the is in as a very unique situation. Our enclaving um, sector is huge, and when you look at the 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 employment in in, in the, the enclaving sector, the vast majority are females. So now you begin to look at, um, at, at the social impact, the social impact. And then you begin to how, see how that translates into stimulus package is going to have an effect on, on, on the government purse. You know, so now, we, now we're seeing things that open up. We're seeing the, um, most people are back out to work. Things are beginning to pick up slowly but surely. So in the, manufacturing, in the manufacturing sector, apart from tourism, have taken um, um, a serious hit as well too. But, um, like you said, we, are, we have a continue to weather the storm carefully, carefully, as, as, as well as a carefully, you know, it's, um, because it's a global pandemic. So even if we are ready, if others are not ready, you have to still be, um, be, be take cautions in, in the steps um, um, that we make. So, in, so within trade, there's a balance between the economic impact that, that must we have to mitigate. At the same time, we still want to stimulate the economy to create jobs and to create employment. And uh, we have to eat, you know. And apart from that as well, too, from the pandemic, we're also in the hurricane season. So we're also looking at, at, at that as well, too. Um, simple thing, um, the last hurricane we had, um, when the Dominican boat couldn't come, we go to the supermarket, there was a shortage in, in, in citrus and bananas and things of that nature. You know, so those are part, are, are a part of um, the, the, the importance and the impact of trade as well, too. 
So we in the hurricane season, we keep our eyes open. Right. Now, Mr. Lawrence, there is a question I want to ask you before I move on to Mr. Queeley. We, we have successfully ratified the CARI Forum EU Economic Partnership Agreement and really the redrafting of the EPA Implementation Bill. How are we capitalizing on the many benefits of this agreement? the CARI Forum EU Economic Partnership Agreement. Yeah, the Economic Partnership Agreement is, um, is comprehensive. So it includes all good services and um, investment as well too. What we have done to make sure that we in six navies are capitalizing and are taking advantage of this agreement, we, as I said before, we have had experts in trading services, um, Trade, uh, trade lawyers, so to speak, to come in here, and we've had um, training at the national level and at the regional level, actually, um, done here in Sikis and Davis. So what we've done, we've taken um, even success stories and had these persons give uh, their own experiences. So, and we continue to have these um, training and exposure to, um, for our nationals to take advantage of, of the, um, the agreement. But first of all, if you have to know what the agreement is, what, um, what, what, what's in there for you to take advantage of. So we continue to have what we call um, awareness and, and education of, 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 of the agreement um, to the public. Apart from that, to, to ensure that, that we take advantage of, 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 of the agreement, we also look at our, our, our policies as well too. So we have to ensure that our policies can facilitate the the, the trade. For example, we have to look at um, e-commerce. Um, we may have a provision in the EPA to take advantage of e-commerce. However, our national law may not allow or uh, facilitate um, this particular trade in this particular um, in a specific mode. So what we do sometimes we go through the, 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 the laws. I guess a legal expert to do what you call um, um, a legal scan, uh, scrub, etc. to look at these specific laws and see what we can do to bring these laws up to date so we can now take uh, advantage of these um, um, specific agreements. So that's, just, uh, that's, just how, that's ongoing. It, uh, it has never stopped. Right. Okay. Now, Mr. Queeley, the man responsible for the Consumer Affairs Department. Now, now the Consumer Affairs Department has the mandate of informing and educating and empowering consumers to really protect themselves in the marketplace. Now, we have seen over the past few months changes in consumer behavior, um, lifestyle, especially given the COVID-19 pandemic and how consumers have to think about their own health and safety. How has the Consumer Affairs Department worked along with the Ministry of Health in ensuring the safety and the health of the consumer within the marketplace? Well, um, on a weekly basis, our officers go into the field along with health inspectors and we conduct various inspections at these supermarkets to ensure that um, the items on the shelf are fit for human consumption, all items which are expired, dented, they are removed from the shelves. Um, the health inspectors, um, they have the authority to remove them from the premises as we, we do not, so they would discard of them. Um, that's the major aspect of making sure that um, persons are safe when consuming items or purchasing items for consumption. Um, outside of that, there hasn't been much change, as you mentioned, on, from what we could see in terms of consumer behavior in terms of spending and purchasing the items. Right. What, what we saw in the beginning was persons were really um, 
purchasing a lot of items out of fear that the ships would stop coming. Mm -hmm. We have not seen that over the, the past months and we do not anticipate that happening. What we saw from the US side was that there was um there was some shortages being created because of meat packaging plants um having the COVID nineteen virus infecting some of its workers and they had to cease operations for a little bit or try to restrict um the sorry they were trying to contain the virus so the processing of the meats was limited and the prices began to go up on the u.s market right mr queely i know that the there has been some work started on a CARICOM consumer protection bill. Do you have any update on that? Um, from 2015, we started doing some serious work on the consumer protection bill because we realized that the legislation that we have right now is somewhat inadequate. Markets change, and we would have to adapt to these changes legislatively. Right now, the document has gone through a series of edits. Um, it's currently at the AG's chambers for review, and we've also sent it out to the Chamber of Industry and Commerce for feedback because we would not want to just pass it to the Parliament without it going to relevant stakeholders for their feedback. We anticipate sometime during this this year 2020 hopefully that we could have it up for first reading and i would also like to say that um in connection with this new legislation it would change the way in which we do business here dramatically for one persons once as i had outlined earlier persons who are found in breach of various sections of the act. They could now face fines and penalties right on the spot. So if you have expired items on your shelves, we could fine you probably $50 per item. And that's just an example of a price at the moment. So we're looking to really ramp up the enforcement um, of the department and not just have the department as more of like um, where they are basically doing a service to remove the items from the store shelves while the store employees themselves are not actually doing that. No, no, with respect to stores, supermarkets and so on, what has been done by the department to really get feedback from the consumers. I know that you go out and you do your inspections and all of that, but how do you get feedback from the consumers and what do you do with that feedback? Well, periodically we, we um, conduct surveys about various issues that might be happening in society to get the consumer's perspective on certain matters. Um, we might issue maybe like 500 surveys on a given topic they complete them and based on the information collected we would then analyze it and create a cabinet submission if we notice that there is a ad, there is a justified problem that we need to fix from it could be from terrible service with internet um your phone service is poor um, right now, as I mentioned earlier in, in the program, we are currently undertaking, are preparing to undertake a survey as to how small businesses have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, with this information, we will create a cabinet submission and outline our findings. 
and our recommendations as to whether the government should intervene and offer some sort of package to small businesses to keep them viable or in business because we cannot afford to have all our small businesses go down the drain. So that is one of, that is the way in which we use these surveys to really get feedback from the public and inform the policy level. And it really goes back again to standards. Even though you have a small business and so on, the business must operate according to certain standards. For example, I was taught that when I buy something, I must have some sort of a receipt or to prove that I would have bought a product. But a lot of small businesses, you don't get a receipt. Suppose something, you, you take that good home and then you realize something is wrong with it and you want to take it back. That is another. How, how, how I, I can say, well, I bought it here. But the person can say, you didn't buy this here. And I really have nothing in my hand to say that this is where I bought the product. That would go back to the Consumer Protection Act that we are trying to introduce. All of these aspects will be covered in that document. Um, persons would be required to issue receipts. I know some persons may have an issue with it because it may cause them to go into expense which they, they, they don't have or they don't want to spend. But in order to advance the business environment here in St. Kitts, we need to start looking at a lot of different ways in which we could really be for protection to the consumers so that they would um, understand that they're getting value for money. Nobody's trying to rob them, cheat them out of anything. So, yeah, this is part of the, the new legislation. You, you would be required to have receipts issued. I know at this moment some people have these little, these little, I don't even want to call it a receipt. It is a, just a little piece of paper with some numbers on it. So that is not sufficient for, for what it is we're trying to accomplish going forward. And it's not even from the point of view that I am thinking that you're trying to rob me. It's just that I need to have proof of purchase that I would have purchased this and I, where I would have purchased it, what day I would have purchased it, when I would have purchased it, from my own records. It is not that I'm suspicious of you, that you want to rob me, that I am not, that you, you are conducting business, you're not conducting business in good faith, but it is my right as the consumer to have that proof of purchase. That is true. It's a basic right. Um, any consumer really has. Mr. Brown, industry, commerce, small business development. Very heavy there. Now, in terms of manufacturing, industries, and so on, we have seen that that has been affected as well given the COVID-19 pandemic. Here in the Federation, it has been affected, and it has been affected uh, globally. What is being done in St. Kitts in terms of the manufacturing, manufacturing industries to try to get them back up, running, and so on again? All right. Um, thank you, Ms. Roy. And you realize that as each one of us would have made a, a presentation or intervention, it, it simply highlighted the complementary work that we do. And, and as such, you know, we, we all will work together in a way, serving the same set of people. Because I, I, I would question, well, trade, who trades? So we're talking about manufacturers, we're talking about small businesses, etc. We, we, we are aware that there has been some impact, but as, as um, Mr. Lawrence, I think, earlier would have alluded to, I think um, we would have done as good a job as we could have done in terms of ensuring that we look at the components we have here. Now, we, we, have, we have policy, 
we have people, we have products. It's a, it's a, a 3P regime that I like to look at sometimes. And of course, while we would have had some setbacks in terms of manufacturing, that would have been kind of exacerbated by the fact that people would not have been able to move. Then you are looking at, at, at the whole retraining and, and retooling of our businesses. So as, 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 as you look at the activities of the ministry, you realize that all would come together to ensure that we are able to not only survive the difficult period, but to move on with things like retraining. Now, the, the, the SBDC, Small Business Development Center, as I would have indicated earlier, would, for all intents and purposes, pull together a series of training sessions. I mean, we would have done some earlier. Things like credit and financial analysis, so that you know, um, participants, persons, business people can analyze financial statements, at least from the perspective of the banker, and, and to see whether they can get you know, funding, etc. We had the breakthrough series. Again, that would have been providing entrepreneurs with tools and strategies to respond in this particular environment, the COVID pandi pandemic climate. And of course, we are looking at the use of social media for business success. I mean, to move beyond just the likes, but to actually turn these platforms into leverage these platforms so that you know businesses can move on. What we have seen is a couple of things emerging. One, while you know our production activities and so on, is, I would say, recommencing. We, we, we did quite a bit to make sure that our manufacturers and our small business people were able to gradually go back to, 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 to business. Well, it's not business as usual. But we note that we would have seen a lot of the, the development of the online, the e-commerce e-commerce activity. Coupled with that, we would have seen some delivery activity, which is one of the areas that, you know, we are pretty certain. We don't have people moving, but as we always say, you know, people have to eat. Services would have to be provided. And so we are, in fact, strengthening and trying to build capacity for our manufacturers our service providers in those areas where they can continue to be productive. It, it certainly would take some doing in terms of getting our people to, to participate in training activities, to take advantage of what is, you know, placed on the table so that they can enhance and improve the way they operate. We, 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 we are aware that um, the, the e-commerce activities would have been something that we, um, we would have been looking at for some time now. We do have um, e-commerce legislation, etc. And so even things like getting paid for your services, the payment platforms, etc. It is, in fact, the way to go, the new norm. And, and while I'm, I'm not able to use this particular program, as, 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 as a training activity. What I would want to, to suggest to our um, business people, our small business people, our entrepreneurs, our manufacturers, is that they participate in things like surveys. Now, we cannot, and, and the government would not be able to just provide for your needs if we don't know what those needs are. We realize that our, our people would have, you know, in a lot stayed away from participating in surveys, participating in little programs and so on. 
where you can provide the information as to how we can help to develop policy, as to how we can put things in place to ensure that a post-COVID business environment would have the proper support of government, of the agencies that are so designed to provide this kind of support. It is, it is really not possible to have it done and to have these interventions without at least knowing what the needs of, of our um, entrepreneurs are and having the input. One of the, the other areas, I mean, and, and as it relates to, um, to, to e-commerce, we are seeing all the meetings. Everybody's having a meeting by Zoom. And so, again, it is important for our entrepreneurs, our business people, to take advantage of the, 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 the training. Equip yourself. Government would, in fact, be providing certain, certain things to ensure that you can, you can acquire the correct equipment and all that kind of stuff. You know, incentives and packages, etc., would assist you. To, to, to acquire that type of equipment, but it's, it's important for us to look at how we transform, we get into the e-commerce e activity, our meetings, our deliveries, um, just, just all of it, to ensure that we can in fact participate in, in, in the global environment, the global business environment as we move forward. Like, like I would have indicated, it's not business as usual, but you have to look for new markets, how do you access them, um, look at niche marketing, etc. How do we provide for, for certain areas? And it, it, is, it is just all important as, as our ministry would work together, the various departments, to ensure that we can, in fact, move our entrepreneurs and our manufacturers, our small businesses, small enterprises, to the next stage, which is post-COVID-19. Right. Now, now, Mr. Brown, do you have any statistics in terms of the number of manufacturing companies that we have here in the Federation and, and the number of small to medium-sized enterprises registered in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis? Um, with me, not exact statistics. However, what, what I can say to you that over the last five years, we would have seen in excess of 300 small business persons accessing the services provided by our small business unit, formerly the National Entrepreneurial Development Division. And, and they, 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 they really would have been accessing various services that we provide, which I would have outlined before. Um, of course, we are, we are also focusing on our manufacturers that we, we tend to, when we say manufacturers, you know, there would have been at least the tendency to, to look at the, um, the, 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 the companies, the entities on the, um, the industrial side. But I think one of my colleagues would have reference our agro-processors, our smaller manufacturers, and in fact, um, we would have created a space. We would have been looking at policy to ensure that we, we also take care of those smaller entities and so that they can see themselves as manufacturers as well and, and you know, be a part of that, that regime that would ensure their success. So um, to answer your question directly, um, I don't have the statistics with me immediately, but what I can say to you, there are hundreds of entrepreneurs, small businesses, who would have been accessing our services and, and, and still looking for that type of assistance um, post-COVID-19. Okay, it would seem to me that given this climate that we are in with people, losing their jobs, having reduced um, work, and so on, that the small business, people starting small businesses um, sector is really the way to go in terms of stimulating the local economy. It is one of the ways to go, really. 
Okay, we are going to go to the phone lines and see if there are people who want to call in and ask you some questions. The numbers to call are 466-2666, 466 -2666. 662-8674, and the overseas number is 1239-645-4500. We await your calls. Right. So... Mr. Laplace, I know that you came to the NEOC on a few occasions and basically doing what you do best in terms of talking about the standards and so on, compliance with standards. Now, sanitizers. I know you brought some sanitizers and you were talking about the standards and so on. Have you found that there have been breaches to the standards in terms of hand sanitizers in St. Kitts and Nevis? That people are just putting something out there to say they're sanitizers, but they're not really effective. Well, that would be a tough one. We can only verify... Um, what we have tested, but we are hoping that persons are following the, the protocols that we suggested in terms of the dilution ratios and all of that. <clears throat> because remember we mentioned in case with dealing with COVID, for instance, it's not about the strength of the alcohol being um, a high percentage that makes it effective. It's the, the the fact that you can keep that alcohol in a liquid state long enough for it to make enough contact with your hands. So that is one of the reasons why it is important to ensure that when you are diluting that um, that product with water, that you you keep in mind that it has to be within that 60. To 70 percent um, range in terms of per percentage to ensure that it is um, effective for use in the in the hand sanitizing um, process. Now you have to also take into account that persons like to add things like tea tree oil and lemongrass and all of that and there is a specific um, mixing procedure and instructions that go along with, with, with this to ensure that in addition to the water that you're adding, you do not further dilute um, that product by adding those um, different um, extracts. Because at the end of the day, you will just have something that smells good on your hands, but it's not effective in terms of what the intent was really um, designed for. So, not killing the virus. <laughs> well, it's not inactivating the virus, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, no, Mr. Lawrence, the CARICOM single market and economy, as you are aware, is critical within CARICOM and the region. How do you see the COVID-19 pandemic affecting the CARICOM single market and economy? Um, the single market and the economy, how has the COVID-19 affected it? From my desk, um, it has only affected it in the way in terms of movement of people. Because they, within, within the single market and economy, you have the movement of people, goods and services. So goods continue to move and services um, continue to move. But in terms of um, um, people itself, it has been only been affected in terms of people because as you realize the borders um, remain closed for, for, for um, people to travel. Um, the, the policies that, um, of course, you know, you cannot stop a national family from returning home, and that is done via um, a chartered um, aircraft. 
So, but in terms of the, the goals of the, of the, the, CS, the, the CSME, single marketing economy, um, it is still, it is still um, being achieved, you know, because at the end of the day, we are looking at basically to, to, to basically um, have a, a more knitted um, union among um, CARICOM member states. So in terms of policies, etc., those things are still being worked on. Um, uh, Mr. Bong had mentioned earlier the use of, 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 the, of the internet. So even during the 24 hour lockdown, we still had Zoom meetings going on. Um, the world doesn't stop, you know. So during the, the, the 24 hour lockdown, the shift system, um, we still had um, meetings, the use of Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams, and some others um, I can recall at the moment. But the goal and the work of the national of the CSME still continues. Um, people are still free to apply for skill certificate. You know, we're still facilitating um, um, trade among some CARICOM member states. Um, Quoted itself still continues to meet. That's the Council on, on um, um, Trade and Economic Development, the ministerial meeting. Um, OSS still continue to meet within the context of the, the CARICOM um, single market and economy. So we still continue to meet, we still continue to, to, to strive to, to deal with issues at the regional level. Um, meetings still continue to, uh, to, 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 to proceed, I should say, to, to, to continue. Um, what at the regional level, though, um, within the CSME, you know, um, issues that the pandemic highlights, um, I want to say it basically kind of give us, um, instead of a carrot, it gives us a stick. So when you're hoping for, to do certain things um, down the road, uh, achieve certain things down the road, you cannot have to do it now. So parts that are put in place, they can speed up, speed up policy um, um, and decision making. So meetings had to, had to come fast and, and, and hurry. The work had, um, had to still continue, but at a, at a faster um, pace. So um, you highlight weak areas that must be um, dealt with. Um, even when, when you look at trade, there are four uh, modalities of trade. One of those are what we call mode one is basically the movement of, of, of this particular service. So then you, then you begin to realize um, we need more bandwidth. We need to work on this X, Y, Z. We need to do this like now, you know. You, you begin to look at, at, at um, regional transportation. And every course, of course, you know, that's, that's, that's a major issue for us, regional transportation. Not just air transport, but, but sea transport as well too. You know, you know the, uh, what's going on with the uh, with LIAT and um, you know, other, other um, entities looking to enter the market, etc., things of that nature. So those are things that, that, that affect um, the CSME movement, regional. Regional, regional integration. That's the key with regional integration. So those are things that have been you know, meetings are still going on. It, ha it has not s slowed down. It has actually, actually speed it up. It actually speed it up. So that's, that's one of the benefits. But like I said, it kind of gave us, um, instead of a carrot, it gave us a stick. So things, you know, things that, uh, things that you thought you had time, more time on, you'd be like, okay, no, 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 we have to do something, do something quick, fast, and in a hurry. You know, and the, as, you know, like I said, um, once people don't move, services don't necessarily move because um, it affects people's um, ability to, to, to provide for themselves. The economic and social economic, economic impact is real. Um, so now we have to now put things in place, policies in place, infrastructure in place to continue to, to, pro, to, um, to provide for ourselves um, um, economically. So it highlight um, our weaknesses, um, internet infrastructure, um, our ability to communicate, our ability to provide for ourselves. Like I said earlier, the, the, the term um, resilience and sustainable um, is a, a keywords that, that now have a um, that now uh, becomes so important in, in how we, 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 we look at policies. Uh, we're talking about backyard farming, but we do not just go to backyard farming to be resilient and to provide for yourself. From a general perspective, we want to move from a backyard farmer to actually becoming um, a, local, a locative and sustainable um, um, entity. 
So those are things that, that, that must be, that, that must be um, put in, in, in the forefront. Um, regional integration is still on the move. That has never been stopped. Um, issues at the, at the minister level do still continue. The ministers still meet, you know. And at, at, I would like to say as that, and the, and the, I don't want to say, and the, the grass level, I will say, as, so to speak. Um, movement of people, skills, etc. Um, issues there are still, be, uh, uh, still being ironed out. Um, people are still free to apply for a school certificate. Movement of people is still an, is still an issue. But you know, the borders are closed um, for people to travel. Um, we, as I know, they will be looking to open up um, the borders again. But um, the goals and the aims of the CSME and regional integration still are um, on the government um, um, agenda and uh, um, priority. In fact, it's actually more necessary more necessary and more important as, as a region to move um, with, in, with, with one goal in mind, um, economic um, resilience and economic um, empowerment for our persons as a whole. Because, I've, you know, the saying that um, a chain is, is as strong as, as, as its weakest link. So at the one time, you can have a, a vibrant sickness and nervous and, and a weak um, situation. Because we affect another thing, one another, you know. You can't have a strong economy one way and a week and a economy and the next way. If you look at regional integration, so it must be a, a level playing field and one can benefit off of that. We all benefit together. So those issues uh, must be highlighted and those issues must be dealt with at the national level and, and of course the regional level. So ministers at the beginning, still, still to me, they can say it become more imperative now that regional integration and all the barriers that affect regional integration become actually be removed. You know. So those are those are still still being looked at and continued um, um, to do so. Now, Mr. Brown, I know there has been a lot of focus on the manufacturing industry, and we realize what has happened because of the pandemic. Some the manufacturing industries were closed for a while and so on because they require people to go in and to work, of course, in an enclosed space. Uh, and so on, physically. What about stepping up in terms of the footloose industries? We're, we're seeing where this is now ever so much important in terms of getting involved in industry, but the footloose industries, things having to do with technology, the internet, and so on. All right. Um that's why, and, and, and you are, in fact, strengthening that point that I may not have made so well. Our, our persons in, in business, our, our business people, our entrepreneurs, our young people, in fact, we've seen them gravitating to that area. We've seen them gravitating to doing stuff online that would, in fact, Change the way business is being done. We 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 are, we are looking at our, our our entertainers. I mean, you know, when when you when you are producing music, you're hoping that some way somehow when you hear it being played, you're making some money. And you know, all of those platforms in terms of how people download your music, how you get paid for it, those are the things. Um, that, that, of course, we are paying some serious attention to as, as, as we, looked, we looked closely at the whole e-commerce um, regime. Now, as a matter of fact, the WTO has, in fact, been looking that direction as well. And those, those of us who have a, a little you know, idea as to what would happen in, in, in that trade world, some small business people would kind of resent the WTO looking their direction. But it is, in fact, one of the benefits where we can now kind of formalize and bring into mainstream the activities of our smaller operators, our entrepreneurs, but in a way that 
they can go global, that they can fit into that whole e-commerce online space. So as we speak, as a matter of fact, I, I left a regional discussion meeting by a VC, of course, and came straight here. And that, in fact, was the topic, e-commerce, trading activity. Okay, now we have to be wrapping up. I give all four of you, starting with Mr. Laplace, um, any additional thing that you would like to, to say? Well, we'll wrap up. Yeah, I think I said most of what I wanted to say initially. Just to add that, um, of course, as I said, we support trade. We are intrinsically linked. We are the, the focal point for a lot of um, international organizations out there as it relates to standards and technical barriers to trade, even the WTO. So we work behind the scenes to ensure that everything runs um, smoothly. And of course, our um, national obligations are met as well with relation to um, food and water safety here in, in St. Kitts. I would just like to encourage persons who want to get into um, the business to, of course, visit um, Mr. Brown's um, ministry, small business development, and that would help in terms of getting you further along in terms of what you need or what you would require. So if you go there and you're planning to get into the food business or you want to make um, a deodorant or something like that to, to assist you in terms of not making the, the mistakes, you, you should... Um, you know, go through the, the, the procedure and ensure that you get the right advice from us before you move forward. So that is just an example of some of the things that we'd like to see moving forward here in St. Kitts. Right. Thank you. And Mr. Laplace, I know you're, you're party to a number of conventions and so on, which we can't get into right here right now. The Stockholm Convention and the uh, Minimata Mini and, and so on. But Lots and lots. Lots of conventions to ensure that, you know, you're maintaining those standards and so on. Correct. International standards. Correct. Mr. Lawrence. Well, I just want to encourage everybody and tell everybody that um, uh, international trade is zero and die. Um, it affects every aspect of, of um, our society. Well, just to highlight some key things that we're working on um, going forward, we'll continue to work on the economic partnership agreement. We know we have Brexit. So it now becomes a, a, a UK instead of a carry form um, agreement. We have the, um, the CSME, we also have the OSS um, movement, of, of course. We also have um, the Trade Facilitation Agreement, which, which we continue to work on. The Doing Business Ranking is an issue that we continue to work on. The National Coalition of Services Industries, that we are continuing to, to work on as well, too. Um, agriculture is one of the key areas that we're keeping our eye on. Um, we need to feed ourselves, and um, goods and services is, is, is how we, we, we basically feed ourselves in terms of trade. So we continue to do our work to make sure that um, Sikhs and Davis remain resilient and we, we find our, 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 our niche um, in the global market um, chain. Mr. Queeley. From the affairs department perspective, um, I would just like to encourage persons to shop smartly. Look at your expiration dates on the items that you're purchasing. If you see a deal that looks like it's too good to be true, it most likely is. The item might be possibly close to the expiration date and you don't even know it, so you'll need to check that closely. Um, we will continue our work at the department to intertwine ourselves with various agencies across the government. Um, right now we are trying to see how we can do some work with the Ministry of Finance to get involved in the business licensing of business licensing by the means of being a part of creating a process where persons would have to be going through um, um, an inspection process before they are verified for business licenses. So that is just one of the ways we we are trying to advance the department going forward. But as I said, Shop smart, ask for a discount. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> Mr. Brown. 
Yeah, we, we, we would just want to, um, we at uh, SBDC, would want to encourage our entrepreneurs, our small business persons, our manufacturers, to link with us. Participate in, in the, the surveys and the studies that we are doing. Um, of course, it is intended to serve you better. We, we with our um, linkages, well, locally, regionally, internationally, would provide you with that bigger brother space, that hand-holding type service, that virtual type assistance that is necessary for growth in a post-COVID environment. So we are not alone and we intend not to leave you alone either. We are all in this together. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all four of you. You know that you are a part of a very important ministry, International Trade and Industry and Commerce and Consumer Affairs, because that goes to the heart of the economic growth of any country. Of course, gross domestic product and so on, uh, economic growth, which then translates itself into economic development. So that ministry plays a key role in terms of economic, sustainable, really, and human development. So I want to thank all four of you, Mr. Laplace, Director of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bureau of Standards. Thank you, Mr. Laplace. Thanks to Mr. Philip, Director of the Department of Industry, Commerce and Small Business Development, very crucial. And Mr. Sean Lawrence, Director of Trade. And Mr. Paul Queeley, Director of the Consumer Affairs Department. Thank you for appearing on today's program. And I'm sure it won't be the last time you will be back at some other point to share all the good news that you're doing in your department. I want to thank all of our callers, all of our listeners. Well, we didn't have any callers today, really. I want to thank all of our listeners to today's program. When we don't have any callers, it really means that the panelists have done such a good work in explaining themselves that they leave no questions at all to the audience. Next week, we will be back for another edition of Working For You. Until then, I am Les Roy Williams. Take care.